as a speaker for today's seminar. Uh, he's a graduate from uh, Nathu Katrina State University. Uh, during his academic career, uh, he received a highly competitive Eisenhower Fellowship and uh, NSF Research Grant. His, his work has been published in more than 20 general papers. Uh, Dr. Shane has been co-investigator for 10 research projects uh, with the FWHA and uh, NCHRP uh, with some other organizations also. Uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Shane to give a talk on his research, uh, I mean, what he has been at doing for the past four or five years. Okay, thank you. Well, I don't, uh, I know some of you, I recognize some of you from a uh, pavement design class that I teach, but I guess a lot of you are, I'm curious to kind of know who I'm talking with. So, uh, I'm just, by a show of hands, how many here are undergraduates? Wow. All of you guys are in pavement or materials classes now, or just, um, is that kind of the, the path to get to this class, or did you just smell pizza as you walk down the path? Well, I'm really glad to be here, and I'm glad you're here. Uh, the title of the, the presentation of the seminar today is Constitutive Modeling of Asphalt Concrete, uh, a Multi-Scale Perspective. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about are models that we use in asphalt concrete, and then I'm going to talk about how that model gets applied into a broader context to do some useful engineering activities. Uh, so don't let the title kind of scare you at all. Uh, it's actually going to be a fairly broad uh, talk. So, the talk today, actually, I'm going to go through a few different bullet points, uh, talk about kind of the objectives of this type of work, this type of research, uh, why this kind of research is, I think, is important, um, and then give some background, and then talk about three specific applications. Uh, the first is going to be a macro scale constitutive model for fatigue and asphalt concrete, and I'll define what that means, uh, and then how I bridge characteristic link scales and then scaling up to full structural performance assessment. And when we're talking about pavements and structures, we're really talking about the pavement structure itself, separate from just the material uh, investigation. And then just a brief kind of wrap up on the presentation. Uh, I think this will be probably about 45 minutes or so, 30 to 45 minutes, and then we'll just open it up to questions if you guys have any. So starting off with the objective, uh, so today, again, it's just going to be about describing constitutive models and how we combine those with multi-scale approaches in order to do something useful for asphalt concrete and asphalt uh, pavement field. So one way to actually frame this work is to look at it in terms of sustainability and resiliency. And sustainability and resiliency is a very broad context, but really what we're talking about with pavements is maximizing our value of the pavement structure. Value being uh, increased performance, it could be lower cost, maximizing the available materials we have to meet the objectives we set forth in design. And there are certain hurdles that, that hinder us from doing this the most efficient way we can. One is de defining our actual system in order to analyze and analyze our pavements into a broader uh, societal context. We have to define the system. Um, we have resource competition from other sources, petroleum for example, we all know that fuel prices are high, uh, so when we, when we fractionally distillate asphalt cement, we may change the properties by getting more uh, gasoline, and then economic hurdles, as well as just a basic lack of technical knowledge on how our materials behave. And, and addressing these hurdles, there are four broad strategies that, that we look at. One is multi-purpose applications, so this would be like looking at a pavement, not just as a a means to transport something from point A to point B, but looking at it in terms of energy harvesting, for example, or pollution abatement, some kind of multi-purpose application, um, new materials, developing materials that haven't been used before, or evaluating materials we have in a new way, and then uh, tying up some operations and maintenance. Some of the graduate students I know are in a, a pavement management course or pavement operations, highway operations course. There are strategies in this area and then changes in design paradigms, both in terms of material design and pavement design as well. Now, where multi-scale analysis comes in is as a link between all of these four strategies. And all of these four strategies span multiple length scales and multiple time scales, and we can use these multi-scale approaches to develop what we call a unified uh, modeling and uh, analysis method. 
So when we do look at, at asphalt uh, technology and look at it as a multi-scale perspective, what we're really talking about is changes or spans in scale, length scale. At one end of the extreme, we have uh, this kind of nano scale where we're looking at the composition of our asphalt binder, not as a just a, a black stuff that we bind aggregates together, but rather looking at what are the compounds within this asphalt binder, what are, what are they, how are they assembled, and then that, that assembly gives us the actual observed behaviors of our, of our material. In the, what you guys are probably more familiar with, or, or will be familiar with soon, are the actual material scales. Where we're talking about asphalt cement binder, uh, <coughs> combination of asphalt cement and small particles, which gives us a, sm a larger characteristic link, up to our mixture, and then ultimately to the uh, pavement itself. Now, multi-scale evaluation is not just focused on one of these components. In the asphalt technology field, we're going to have two broad areas that people have historically looked at. One set of folks look at asphalt binder only. This is where the uh, grading systems that we have for our asphalt binder, our purchase specifications come from. The idea being, if I understand the binder, then I can say something useful about the pavement that will eventually be made with that binder. And there's another camp, another group of folks who look at mixture only. And they're thinking, well, if I understand what the mixture behaves like, then I can infer properties of the binder by knowing the mixture, and then I can predict or guess, really, how the pavement will perform by knowing how the material will perform. And it turns out that neither one of these camps is exactly right. And you can't use on your own binder or mix to look at the material behavior. And so we need to develop techniques that allow us to bridge this gap between binder and mix. And if we can do that, if we can bridge this, this boundary, then we work another boundary over to the paper. So when we talk about multi-scale analysis, what we're really talking about is each of these individually, but then how do we link them together in order to do a, a useful prediction or a useful analysis. So, when you look at how this has been done and how we've considered materials in the past, we generally fall into a performance model kind of relationship. Uh, and this falls under, in asphalt anyway, two broad areas. We have fatigue, all right, where we will bend a beam and we'll count the number of times that I bend it in order to reach failure. And I'll develop some kind of relationship to that where I said my input bending and how many cycles that material lasts. Okay, left hand side it's a useful parameter like cycles to failure, right hand side it's some input. So this is fatigue, we also have the same kind of basic relationships that we use for rutting. When we talk about pavements we're generally talking about two main phenomena, rutting, which are longitudinal depressions in our wheel path, I'm sure you encounter those especially at intersections, and then we have fatigue or cracking in the material. So a, a standard performance model approach would look at relating input in terms of cycles to an accumulation of distress. We call these basically performance models. Now a constitutive model is fundamentally different than the performance model. It's at, a, it's at a second higher level. You can think of it as if I have a performance model, I cannot get to a constitutive model. But if I have a constitutive law, I can get to this performance model. And you've all encountered constitutive laws before. So a, a constitutive model is simply a mathematical function that relates stress and strain. And you've all encountered one of these, I hope by now, in form of a uniaxial Hooke's law, or an elastic material, where we've related stress and strain with some constant of proportionality. Now, this is a simple equation, but we do quite a bit with this equation. And in fact, you guys are, or have or will take three or four courses at the undergraduate level, and then who knows how many at the graduate level, that'll teach you how to use this equation to solve useful engineering parameters or problems. Those could be beam deflection. We don't even think about this, right? We don't think about how would we do this if we didn't have this law. It's ingrained in you by the time you're coming through the uh, curriculum. So we might analyze a beam deflection, uh, again, pressure vessels, any kind of advanced analysis. It all comes down to ultimately a fairly simple constitutive relationship. So this is what I'm talking about today. This kind of constitutive relationship or law that relates stress and strain, and then how we can do something practically useful with that, and then how we span multiple scales. 
And I'm going to do that with a couple of examples. And the first is macro scale modeling or modeling of the mixture. We call it a macro scale because it's a uh, scale that we can physically see. We handle asphalt concrete. And then how do we model that fatigue process? And if you look at how fatigue evolves, and I've shown an equation and now here's some actual data that shows you how fatigue happens in, in asphalt concrete. As I increase my input, my strain, basically as I build my beam more, more amount and more amount and reflect it more, I'm going to have to do that fewer times in order to get it fail. More strain equals, more, equals less cycles to fail. And we might, in a, in a performance model, we might fit this to a simple relationship and then uh, use that in some kind of analysis. <coughs> but as a constitutive law, what we want to look at are what are the behaviors of the material? What are the mechanics or the mechanisms that are happening inside the body? And then develop the model of those, to those mechanisms instead of the end product performance measure. And, and that can be done in fatigue by using something called continuum damage. Now, at a very simple level, continuum damage is about equating parameters with idealized structures. Okay? And so, when we look at damage, what we're talking about are these small little micro cracks. You can't see them with your eye, but they're there, and they're occurring throughout the body. And so, that's demonstrated by this little schematic here, where I have some body, it has a modulus. Because I've loaded it several times, I've developed all these micro cracks, and they're all throughout the body of the material. But with continuum mechanics, I'm going to equate that to a second body. Now, this second body has no damage, but it has a reduced or a different value for the modules. Now, I'm, I'm denoting that with C. No longer do I have these areas where I have some E and then a crack. Rather, I have a homogeneous medium now with a different module. And the constitutive law for this is written fairly simply by replacing the E that I had with C. Okay. Now it turns out that doing this with asphalt concrete is not quite so simple. Asphalt concrete is a viscoelastic material. And a viscoelastic material, unlike what this constitutive law is showing you for an elastic material, the response of that depends on temperature, it depends on frequency, and other parameters that elastic materials don't. Now, you've all encountered viscoelastic materials, and I like this demo because it's, it's kind of fun, and I usually hit a student at least once with it. But a viscoelastic material that you've all encountered at some point in your life, I hope, I never got to play with it, but so be it, is Silly Putty. Silly Putty is a viscoelastic material. Okay? Now, Silly Putty is kind of fun. What's going to happen if I ball it up into a little ball? You guys in the front. I, I take a good idea. So this is just silly putty. It's the same material I took out of the egg. Hopefully you've been able to play with it at some point in your life. And I'm going to bounce it. All right? I'm going to load it very quickly. Very fast load. Bounces like a rubber ball. But I take the same material and put it between my fingers and just apply a very small amount of load for a very relatively long time. And what happens to that material, hopefully you can see if I turn it to the side, is it's deformed. Now, same material, I haven't played, I'm not a magician. What I've done is apply a different loading rate. When I bounce it, it's very fast. And it bounces. And there's no, you have to take my word for it, there's no little divot here because the material is relatively stiff, but short loading gives us a, a long time. And we can look at that when we look at the material in terms of loading frequency. And now, on the y-axis, I've plotted this term. It's called dynamic modulus. But for the purposes of this presentation, you can kind of think of it like an elastic modulus, like we have elastic modulus of steel, for example, versus something called reduced frequency. And reduced frequency is like frequency. It's like my loading it fast or loading it <coughs> slow. And what we find is that if I load this material, this asphalt concrete, quickly, it responds stiffly. Just like when I bounce this rubber ball. Or, excuse me, silly button. But if you load it slowly, it responds with a relatively low modulus. Okay? 